All right, Shabbat Shalom, everyone, and uh, welcome to our Exodus study. We are now in um, Exodus chapter 11, and uh, <laughs> what a journey we've we've come through. Um, we have looked at uh, the water uh, turned to blood from uh, as the first plague. We looked at the frogs. We looked at the lice. We looked at the flies, the cattle, uh, the boils, uh, the hail, the locusts, and the darkness. And we've watched how Yahuwah has lined all of those plagues up with a deity uh, that needed to be stripped down from the aspect of the thinking of the Egyptians. He took away their ideas um, that a God and Elohim controlled these things and shows how he himself controls all these things. And I think it's important that, you know, these aren't just, you know, things that he's doing, but he's specifically stripping their them of their belief system. You know, showing him that he is the only one true and living. He says, I am that I am. I am the one that I exist, that exists. I am the only one that exists. You know, there is no other Elohim. I've created all things that live and breathe. So he's bringing these things and he's funneling all these actions uh, that Pharaoh is doing to eventually let his people go, his firstborn. So we we come to chapter 11, <clears throat> and if you remember at the end of chapter 10, Moshe uh, says to Pharaoh in, in 29, verse 29 of chapter 10, so Moshe said, you have spoken well, I will never see your face again. So he is looking at, at, at Pharaoh's stance. He's looking at being obedient to the father and we're going to learn something about faith and obedience through these next couple chapters as we not only see the entrance of this final plague, but we also see the Passover introduced and in, in how we became Yahuwah's people. So let's look at this chapter. Uh, there's only nine verses in this chapter. So um, let's let's read the whole chapter and then, you know, go back and discuss it. So who would like to uh, to read? Anybody? No hand? Jake? Okay, there's JP. All right, all right, bro. <laughs> it said in verse chapter 11 of Exodus, And Yahuwah said unto Moses, Yet will I bring one plague more upon Pharaoh and upon Egypt. Afterwards he will let you go hence. When, you, when he shall let you go, he shall surely thrust you out hence altogether. Speak now in the ears of the people and let every man borrow of his neighbor and every woman of her neighbor jewels of silver and jewels of gold. And Yahuwah gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Moreover, the man Moses was very great in the land of Egypt, in the sight of Pharaoh's servants and in the sight of the people. And Moses said, Thus saith Yahuwah, about midnight will I go out into the midst of Egypt, and the, all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die. From the firstborn of Pharaoh that sitteth upon his throne, even unto the firstborn of the maidservant that is behind the mill, and all the firstborn of beasts. And there shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as there was none like it, nor shall be like it any more. But against any of the children of Israel shall not a dog move his tongue, against man or beast, that you may know how that Yahuwah doth put a difference between the Egyptians and Israel. And all these thy servants shall come down unto me and bow down themselves unto me, saying, Get thee out, and all the people that follow thee. And after that, I will go out. And he went out from Pharaoh in a great anger. And Yahuwah said unto Moses, Pharaoh shall not hearken unto you, that my wonders may be multiplied in the land of Egypt. And Moses and Aaron did all these wonders before Pharaoh and Yahuwah's Oh, and Yahuwah hardened Pharaoh's heart so that he would not let the children of Israel go out of his land. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What do you see, brother? Uh, well, I just have to probably go back to the beginning. I want to. I don't want to go into the end verses. So, 
<laughs> verse two, you know, <laughs> verse two is, uh, you know, something that with verse two, that's, you know, quite interesting to me is that, you know, the people are going to borrow, it says, from the Egyptian people, you know, it's like, so now you're going to have, you know, I don't know, it seemed like the Israelites were below the Egyptians, you know, they were below those people. So in this land, they're going to go and borrow all these jewels of silver and jewels of gold, you know, before they go. And, and it feels like at this point, you know, they're just told to do this. They're told to do this. There's no, you know, we, we don't, there's no really explanation because again, at this point, they just, all they know is go and borrow gold and go and borrow silver or jewels. And so it's kind of interesting when you think of it that way. It's like if Yahuwah tells you to go and do something and you don't know the end result, you're just going to go and do it and then we're going to find out. So I just thought that was interesting that they would, they would borrow like that and uh, what they'll see come out of it. Shalom. Yeah, um, that, that's also translated ask, ask of your neighbor uh, for these things. And remember, some of these same things are used uh, to build the tabernacle later. Um, you know, and it's interesting, you know, because, you know, one of the things you raise is that you, you don't know of these things, you're told to do these things, but yet you don't know the outcome, but yet you do them. Here lies the entrance, as we saw with Abraham, of faith, belief and faith, obedience and faith. So this is the trademark of the believer is one that obeys Yah and does the things that Yah tells him to do, but has faith in that he who tells him is the one. You know, this is always going to be the order. You know, the New Testament, it's not new in the New Testament that they have faith. This is this started from the beginning, you know, so it's important that we enter, we see the entrance of these things, the first mention of these things, because this is the, the foundation of those that believed in him. Matter of fact, this was the, exemplif the exemplifying characteristic of the Hebrew all throughout. We're going to see going through the next chapters that the Hebrew is the one that has faith in and obeys. Hallelujah. So we got we to gotta continue to be mindful of the things that are coming out. What else do we see? Sister June. Well, there's a lot of good information in here. We got my information, or my interest, I would say, is uh, the same thing that Brother JP brought out. But if you look at the first, he, he's, already, he's telling us that he's going to bring one more plague upon Pharaoh. So he's preparing the people, Why? you know, because this is the first time he says something like this throughout this whole process, you know even though he went in, in, the, in to, to request the people to be set free. This is the one time when Yahuwah says, this is the one more that I'm going to bring that's going to break the Pharaoh's back, basically. He's like, so you're going to get yourselves ready and prepared, you know. And, and if you go into that verse, I went and looked at this because it's, there's a lot of interesting spots in here that you don't really see where he's, like you said, when in, in the verse 2, where he says, you know, um, let the people ask every every man from his neighbor and that word neighbor there is actually meaning a friend a companion or a fellow so he, he you think about that and then he goes in to say the same thing to the woman go do this and and ask for articles of silver and of gold so he's telling them i'm about ready to deliver you guys go ahead and get prepared here um and start getting all of this stuff that i'm telling you so you're going to be able to take it with you on this journey that's going to prepare you for this kingdom that I'm about ready to deliver you into, this new land. And then we look at the Aleph Tavs in here in three and says, Yahuwah gave the people Aleph Tav favor in the sight of the Mitzrayim. So he inspired through this covenant that he had with his people, he's inspiring favor during this time. Think about that, you know, so that they're inspired to, to go ahead and do, to give unto the, 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 the uh, Yasralites, what they're asking of the silver and gold, because now they know at the end this is going to be it. So they, and it's interesting that they actually gave it to them that night before they actually left. So it's like these people are are perplexed. They're ready to to, to get these people out of here in haste, as the scripture says. 
And then there's one more uh, left tabs it's, it's, it's in uh, verse 10 where it says, and, and, and Moshe and Aaron did a left tab all these wonders before Pharaoh, and Yahuwah hardened a left tab Pharaoh's heart, so that he would not let a left tab the children of Yisrael go. So this is like, you see in that final description how this is Yahuwah's plan. He's orchestrated step by step by step to get these people to this final 10th plague where he's finally telling people, okay, you know, I've hardened his heart all this way. Now I'm going to give him that final one. Get ready to go. I'm setting you people, my people free. I'm, I'm doing that promise. I'm, I'm, I'm giving that, I'm, I'm performing that promise that I told you I would deliver you. You know, I heard your cries and here I am. And I see all of this right here. It is a beautiful image when you see all of those left halves and how he's, how he's prepared his people and the Egyptians so that they, they can leave with the maximum Reward, benefit if you are a baraka if you want to say they is taken from their captives you know he he set the captives free right it, it kind of one of those things like the, the captive took the captives and made it in the, the captivity and the captive right so beautiful stuff man that's all i see there yeah i like what you said about verse verse two and three um as far as the favor in which he showed because it says you know and Yahuwah gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Moreover, the man, Moshe, was great in the land of Egypt, in the sight of Pharaoh's servants and in the sight of the people. So when they asked of them for these things, it was a gift they were willing to give. Like they, they, they trusted and had faith in even a leader that wasn't theirs. But they saw the acts of Moshe and gave favor to them and his people, and they, they willingly gave those things that Yahuwah said uh, for them to ask for. So very good point um, to pull out there. Um, June, you had something you want to say? Um, yeah, praise Yah, Shabbat Shalom, everyone. It, as, as tragic as this, this particular plague is with, you know, people dying, uh, particularly the Egyptian firstborn, it, it was like a it was like a mic drop moment for Yahuwah because you know the the specificness of this particular plague you know it, it would have been one thing if it was like oh people just started dying you know and and it didn't affect the children of Israel but affected the Egyptians but this is real specific the firstborn you know of the Egyptians and the firstborn of the cattle. I mean, who, who could orchestrate that where, you know, the, the, every, everyone's firstborn, you know, animal or person. I mean, that's pretty spectacular. You, you can't attribute that to anyone but Yah. Like that can't be, that can't be, you know, you know, like a random disease or, you know, it, cause he says, he says, and you know, he gave the word, I, this is what I'm gonna do, smite the firstborn. And then everyone's firstborn starts dropping. You know that, that he's proving his, his word that way. Uh, and it's also beautiful the way he, the provision he provided, you know, the covered by the blood, if you will, um, for the death angel to pass over us. And, uh, and yeah, it, you know, and also reading verse two that was just brought out about the um, gold and silver, it makes me sad knowing what they end up doing with that, you know, with the golden calf too. But well, I yeah, think. some of it they used for the golden calf, but some of it they used for the building of the tabernacle as well. So okay. uh, the temple. So, but very good point in what, what you brought out as far as the firstborn. And remember, this comes from their direct, disobedience to Yah, because he says in chapter four, he says, verse 22, it says, then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus saith Yahuwah, Israel is my son, my firstborn son. So I say to you, verse 23, let my son go that he may serve me. But if you refuse to let him go, indeed, I will kill your son, your firstborn. So it was a promise back in chapter four 
that you withhold my first son from me, I'm going to take your first son from you. And this wasn't just the first son. Like you said, it was the first of the cattle, you know, uh, the livestock, which, which, you know, was all of their economy. It was stripping them of everything. So um, very good point. Um, what else we see there? Anybody? Come on, y'all. Oh, JP. Uh, well, just again, I, I mean, <clears throat> looking at the, the verse again and um, chapter, I mean, verse seven, we see this throughout all the all of the plagues. You know how the there will be a there will be a separation or a difference between the Egyptians and Yasharal or Israel. And um, I was looking. At, I believe it was in Revelation seven. It's one of my. It's becoming one of my uh, favorite verses sometimes. That when he speaks about um, saying, it says in verse three. I'll just go to verse three of Revelation seven. It says, saying not to not hurt the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed. No, it's not it. But I'm looking for the, uh, there's a portion where it talks about the locusts not touching those that have been sealed with uh, the seal of Elohim in their foreheads. And so it just, but, it, but when we get to Revelation, we're seeing the same thing. There's a division between those that are not of Yahuwah and those that are of Yahuwah. And the same situation happens where we see, you know, what these plagues and, and the way that uh, things play out, everything plays out, you know, life. And so I just continue to see that how when you are set apart, you know, you, you have that step, you're separated in that way. And like he tells the disciples, you know, you're of, you're going to be in the world, but you're not of the world. You, so there is a separation between you and the world. And, and so I've always constantly put that in my heart that Yahuwah has showed us like, you know, here you are, you're in, I'm over here in California. In the city I'm in, I don't see many people around me that I, I know of. I know they're there. I know they're in Fresno, but I don't meet them. I don't interact with them. And I'm like, wow, like he truly has set people apart where you're at for a purpose and for a reason and to continue to be that light. So I just see that same thing happening here. But I, don't know, I just kind of went on over that. <laughs> so. You're not. I mean, that's that's the direction that these passages are going through. The, what you're pointing out, the separation, because the separation, Yahushua says, my sheep hear my voice, right? Yahuwah is saying, I'm separating you. And how am I separating you from those who are obedient and those who are disobedient? Because remember, everything that happens, happens because of either disobedience or of obedience. And it all has to do with faith and obedience in him, which is the foundation, right? So we're going to look at that, you know, as we go through, because there's some specific passages as we go into chapter 12 that I'm going to pull out to, to pinpoint that. But that's always the separation. Uh, Shaul, we, uh, Yahusha, Shaul, you will know them by their fruits. Fruits come from only those trees that follow the streams of water. That are planted by it. What is our water? Our water is the word. Are we planted in it? Do we have fruit? You know, our, our, our families, you know, do do our families exhibit what our fruit is? You know, can I can I can I look can I come to your house, JP, and see Leticia in the word? Or maybe, maybe every now and then hearing and teaching the women or leading them the women's ministry. Do I see your sons, your son and your daughter, you know? talking to, you know, maybe another kid, maybe Darius, for example. Do, do, do I see them talking about scripture, you know, on Marco Polo? You know what I mean? Yes, I do. You know, that is your fruit. You know, those are signifying signs of one that is a true follower. Just because you got a name, just because you have a particular hue of skin, just because you come from a certain place, means absolutely nothing, you know? There are believers of the bloodline that have nothing to do with Yah from now and, and forever. 
you know, but those who trust and obey and follow, those are the true Hebrews. We see that. Trust, faith, and obey, right? So that's going to be a theme from Genesis <laughs> to Revelation. And we need to understand that this is the entrance of it. This is the this is the art or the uh the uh meant the first the first the law of first mention. We see the law of first mention and everything throughout scripture follows it. You know, we saw Adam obey, we saw him disobey, we saw Abraham obey, we saw him disobey, you know. Jacob, Isaac, Joseph, you know, when they obeyed, they were seen of Yah. When they did not, the wrath comes, right? So we have to be mindful that these are the foundations of our faith. Trusting, having faith, and obeying him. Only those who obey will look like him. He literally tells us in the next chapter, when I come by, I'm looking for the blood. If you don't have the blood, what happens? You die. Why? They didn't know what the blood meant. They did it because they trusted and obeyed what he told them to do. And those that didn't perished. Praise you um, Brother Mecca and then Sister Amy. Uh, did you guys go over the uh, how they had, I just stepped away for a quick second. Um, did you guys go over how the Yehud gave them favor in the sight of the people yet? Yeah, we did, but I mean, uh, yeah. add to it. Go ahead. You might have okay. something different. Yeah, no, one thing I was just, because looking back at, ver, you know, chapter 10 um, in, verse, in verse 7, you know, he, it says, and Pharaoh's servants, uh, and Pharaoh's servants said unto him, how long shall this man be a snare unto us? Let the men go that they may serve Yahuwah Elohim. Uh, know you not that Mitzrayim is destroyed? So you even see, like, in verse, you know, just going back to chapter 10, like how Yahuwah, through everything that he's done, he's, he's, <laughs> these people, they reverence him, you know, and, and so just seeing that here, you know, I just, you know, I just wanted to bring it out because it's, it's, you know, the way Yahuwah turned the hearts of the Mitzrayim to, you know, Moshe, you know, that they respected him now, you know, that they, um, you know, that they looked upon him, um, that he, you know, he was very great in the land of Mitzrayim because they were like, yo, this, whoever this man is, <laughs> his Elohim is no joke, you know, and so they took him very serious, um, you know, because of Yahuwah and the works that he did in, in Mitzrayim. So I just, you know, I thought that was, I really, I really like that, especially how it connected with chapter 10. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, you know, very important to see how all of these plagues that attacked them didn't touch the Israelites as well. So they knew that they were highly favored. They knew that they trusted in something higher than what they were believing into as well. Great, great, great stuff, brother. Um, Sister Amy and then uh, JP. Sorry. Yeah, um, the scripture that comes to mind was, um, and I find it interesting as well, that in, I think it's in verse 10, chapter 10 or 9 that we read, um, when he, he cursed them with the darkness, the darkness that they could feel. And then obviously this is after, this is after that. Well, if, you, if we go to uh, Matthew, um, Matthew 24, verse 30, sorry, verse 29 and 30, it says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from Shamaim and the powers of the Shamaim shall be shaken. Verse 30. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in the Shamaim heaven and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great esteem. Um, sorry, uh, I don't think that was the one. I must have a different version. The one that I was looking at was one where it says they shall mourn as though for a firstborn 
child. Um, mine's a different translation, but I know some translations say that. Um, I find that interesting that you have, it speaks of darkness, and then it speaks of the firstborn son of Mashiach, um, Abba Father, sorry, uh, Mashiach. And then in this encounter, we see the darkness again, taking place over Mitzrayim, Egypt. And then all the Egyptians, firstborns killed. And here it says, they, when they see the Son of Man, shall mourn as though for a firstborn. I find that very interesting. I don't know whether it's related. I think it could be. But uh, I'll let you give me Yeah, Zechariah, Zechariah 12, 10. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. You know, and, and, and understanding uh, in, in the whole idea that they may have missed who the Messiah was when he was here the first time, now seeing him return, you know, as their Messiah, you know, and, and, and wail, you know, when you lose a firstborn son, you wail, you know, you fall, you crumble, you, you go into a fetal position. It's, it's, it's to, to show agony, but also joy too, in seeing who your Messiah is as well. Um, JP, and then I'll point something out. Um, well, I was just, uh, you know, thinking, and I was reading some things before, but it says all the firstborn. And so I, I can only imagine, because, you know, when we see movies, right, I see movies, it's always like babies. It's always just the babies. It's never like, but I'm starting, you start thinking about adults. Yeah. Grown men, like, you know what I'm saying? No matter what their age is, they're the firstborn of their family. Mm -hmm. done and that's the inheritance right like we spoke about even with Yeshua like the inheritance was the firstborn we see it in the firstborn always and so we take that same understanding we're like whoa grown men just bam died <laughs> wives are crying now you know if you so it's just not the screaming of parents it's like oh my my child it's just you know just stacks and so that was pretty amazing just to think about that and uh just to bring that to the table that it really amplified the idea of the firstborn. And then since Pharaoh didn't die, so I was like, well, then, you know, it kind of alludes to Pharaoh. Maybe it's, he had an older brother that died or something, you know what I mean? But before he became Pharaoh. So that's kind of interesting just to kind of put that into context of, of what we're seeing. But um, so, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. Yeah, no, I mean, I think um, I think when you look at, you know, that idea, you know, that it's a, a baby, you know, um, we see, you know, like you said, you, you, when you think of the movies, even the cartoons, it's always a little, a little child, but the full perspective of, of them crying for their firstborn wasn't, necessarily a baby like a baby not that you're not attached to a baby but how attached are you to a 30 year old that is the heir to your family you know that is going to carry out your family name that has been an upstanding child you know all of this you know goes into the mindset of the pain and anguish that they receive when yahuwah you know brings this promise to full and fruition from chapter four you know, this is what I think of my firstborn, and you're beating and torturing her, him, you know, her. So uh, it is to give a full picture of the wrath of Yahuwah as well. Like all of these instances where we're seeing these different plagues are an exemplary picture of what the wrath, those that disobey, those that turn away from him, receive. So, um, Great picture, brother. I mean, that that's that's a good picture because I th you're absolutely right. We, you know, we are. I, I, uh, when I'm reading this, I'm thinking a baby, you know. But what you just said brings truth to um, the reality of what happened here, right? So, praise y'all for that. Um, uh, I'll let Sister Poppy go, and then um, and then I'll go ahead and, and share the verse that I was looking at. Go ahead, sister. I don't have anything of real value to add, but I did want to say that I have experienced um, 
my 21 year old son passed away and a sound came out of me that I've never made before or since I crumbled to the ground and it was the most horrific thing I've ever experienced in my life. And I, it, it, so yeah, I, I feel for anyone who loses a baby, but my son was my, I, I knew him. Right. I had a chance to know him and see who he was. And it, it was devastating. So that's all I wanted to add. Thank you. No, thank you. Sister. Emotional yeah. chapter for me. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, no, nah, that, that was, that don't downplay that. That was of great value. You know, it gave us a true picture of what we just finished talking about. You know, someone that experienced something so painful, someone that understands the cry and the wail of the loss of the firstborn is of great value to our understanding. You know, I think Yahuwah always wants to illuminate, you know, his scriptures to us through the experiences of his people. So, you know, first, first of all, I'm so sorry you had to deal with that um, you. in your life. Um, but it, but it does draw a greater picture and expound upon what JP just shared and what we talked about. So praise God. Thank you for sharing that, sis. Sure. Brother, Ron, before you go off to where you're going to go, I, I'm, I've been looking at this uh, verse 7. Verse 7. And, I, and, I, and, you know, when, you, when you're looking at it, the way that it's spoken in the English, it creates a different kind of picture than what I'm seeing here. Because I've looked at these words, and the way they have it says, it says, but against any of the sons of Israel, a dog will not even bark, whether against man or beast that you may understand how Yahuwah makes a distinction between e uh, Egypt and Israel. But when I'm looking at here and looking at it word for word in, in the uh, lexicon, it says that the, the whole or all the sons of Yasharel, a dog to, to cut, to sharpen, or to decide. So I'm hearing that the dog was a signal during this time, used the dog and then this word from uh, uh, can also be uh, uh, used as a word of like because of, or uh, it has in a sense of that kind of meaning. So it's because of this dog it, it, sounding this uh, alarm that, it, or by reason of this dog sounding this alarm, if you will, man, uh, so it's basically to cut or to sharpen or to decide because of man, or in that sense, as far as, or even to a beast, an animal or cattle, to know who or which that Yahuwah has separated or heard distinction and interval between the sons of Egypt and the sons of Yahuwah, Yasharel. So it's a different picture that I see here painted when you look at word for word, how it really shows us that example of that moment in time as Yahuwah is making a distinction here between uh, using this dog as a sound when this death Malachim or, uh, of Yahuwah came in, yeah? To, to make that distinction between the two and, and began to do the work that he did that night. And I see it in a different way. I, I wasn't knowing what he was trying to show me. I was just looking at this like, what am I What am I seeing here? I was staring all this time you're talking, so I didn't really pay attention to much of what you were saying. But I see this, and now it's like, wow, that's a whole different description that I'm seeing here because of that. You know, it really changes the story a little bit for me. So I just wanted to share that. How dare you not pay attention? <laughs> Nah. Hey, you know what? I can't do two things at one time. Yeah. I'm like some people, I gotta be focused. So yeah, no, nah, I'm I'm kidding. You know I'm kidding. Um, but I think I think you're right in that. You know, it's important to understand the context of that verse. You know, and knowing, you know, that no tongue, no bark, no alarm will go against my people. You know, there will be a clear distinction between Israel in Egypt. And what we find out later, because this is, remember, this is just the announcement of what he's going to do in chapter 11. When he actually does it, we see 
that it has nothing to do with just because you're Israel. It has to do with obedience to what he told them to do. And those that did what he told them to do, they were Israel. That, because the marker was on the door post, on the, on the, on the lentil, you know, you know, on the, on the, on the basin, you know, the, it, it was, it was all around it. I didn't see death for that home. There was no alarm there to speak against it. So absolutely, you, you illuminated um, the Passover right there, brother. I appreciate that. That's, that's a good. Um, but I was looking at something that, uh, that I see here and, and it's something that, is introduced here. Um, in the sense that we're going to have to pay attention to it as we go along, because it's a character tree. And that's in verse eight. Uh, verse eight says, and all these your servants shall come down to me and bow down to me saying, get out and all the people who follow you. After that, I will go out. Then, speaking then, he, Moshe, went out from Pharaoh in great anger. And I was looking at that, and I was looking at anger and, and obedience in kind of a, a, a fog that, 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 that inhibited Moshe from obeying Yah. When he got angry, it inhibited him from obeying Yah. What am I talking about? Let's look at um, Numbers chapter 20. Um, and I'll read a couple verses, uh, 9 and 11. It says, so Moshe took the rod from before Yahuwah as he commanded him. And Moshe and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock, and he said to him, Hear now, you rebels, must ye bring water from out of the rock? Verse 11. Then Moshe lifted his hand and struck the rock twice with his rod, and water came out abundantly, and the congregation and the animals drank. Right? But prior to that, he tells him to speak to the rock. Right? Verse seven, he says, then Yahuwah spoke to Moshe saying, take the rod, you and your brother Aaron, gather the congregation together, speak to the rock. So it's important to obey his commands, even no matter what we're going through emotionally, to have faith in that he will work. And you say, well, wait a minute, he, he couldn't have been that wrong because didn't he say before to hit the rock? He did tell him to hit the rock before. He said in chapter 17 of Exodus, he tells him, chapter 17, verse 6, he says, uh, Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock in Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water will come out of it that the people may drink. So it's very important to pay close attention to what Yahuwah says because his anger for what the people did was a representation of who Yah was. And he was telling him to do exactly what I tell you to do. If you don't, you give out the wrong picture. If you don't obey me, you give out the wrong representation. I can't now let you into the promised land because of your anger. And, and this was something that is introduced here that we have to pay attention to in Moshe because it was a character flaw that prevented him from seeing the, the, the promised land, you know? So, so let's pay attention to these little, little nuggets that happen, you know, so that the, it fulfills our understanding as we try to understand why things happen in scripture, right? They're not just words here. Like there's a story here. There's a, there's a frame here that is being built for us to see. Praise God. That's powerful, brother. Yeah. That's powerful just that because he told him before to strike it. This time he told him to speak to it, but he struck it. He wasn't paying attention to the detail. That, that's powerful. Just that one. And it was because of his anger. Absolutely. 
It blinded him. It blinded him. It clouded him. It separated him literally from the promised land, right? So that's a powerful image, man. Praise God. Never really J noticed that before. That's really powerful. Obedience. JP and then Jim. Yeah, I, I was looking at that same verse like, what? You know, because the way it was spoken in verse 8, it's, you know, we see this is Yahuwah speaking, you know, to, to Moses at this time. And he says, and in the King, you know, King James type of format, it says, and all these thy servants shall come down unto me and bow down themselves unto me, saying, get thee out of all the people that follow thee, and after thee I will go out. And it's just kind of like, you know, we see that it was just interesting. He called them his servants. He calls the people of Egypt his servants you know they're they're like and the only way i can picture is like moses being you know in the representation of yahuwah to the people he's like they're looking at him like you know you're representing yahuwah you're you're like and they're bowing down in the sense of you know get your people out of here and and so that was a but the phrase that term the serve they it like flipped you know, because this whole time the Israelites were the servants. You know what I'm saying? This whole time, and all of a sudden it flipped. Where even those that are were the 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 masters at that point, the Egyptians became servants. You know, and so I just thought that was an interesting wording, and you had brought that verse. So it kind of, I, I was seeing with uh, some things. It was just amazing, though. It's just the way it flipped around, though. <laughs> and they acknowledged it. So I should I say they acknowledged it. That's what really. Took it to the next level. Shalom. Absolutely. Praise Yah. Uh, June. Praise Yah. It was it was very interesting what you you brought out about Moshe's anger here. Uh, in my translation, it says he walked away with great displeasure. Um, but I, you were also citing in Numbers, and I, I remembered in the in the woman study, um, we studied in Numbers. 12 verse 3 it says now the man Moshe was very humble or meek above all the men which were on the face of the earth like so it's basically saying he was the most humble man at that time and but yet you were saying how he had this you know the character of the anger and you know that prevented him from going in the promised land and it reminded me of King David because it, it says about King David, he was a man after Yah's own heart. Um, but yet, you know, he had these sins like the adultery and killing a man. Um, and there were consequences for that. His, his son died, even though he prayed like, you know, Yah, please don't take him. He still died. And so we see even when, you know, people are upstanding, there is consequences for bad actions or, or or character falls like anger, you know, and perhaps that's why in the Brit it says, you know, do not sin in your anger. So it's not necessarily wrong right. to be angry, but it's when we sin in our anger, you know. Um, so I just wanted to share that. Great point, great point, because the anger, right, the anger, very good point, the anger is not a sin. The sin is the disobedience. He was angry because of the way the Israelites were, were acting. That within itself is not so bad. What caused the separation is that anger clouded him from being obedient to the Father. So that he struck the rock in his anger versus speaking to the rock, as Yahuwah told him. So a very good point um, that it was the sin in his anger that caused the separation from you. Good point. Fruit. See, so y'all, that's fruit. Fruit. <laughs> y'all missed that. Uh, let me see. That's my wife. You get it? She's my fruit. You know. Anyway, uh, Sister Chantel, <laughs> then uh, Omeka. <laughs> so much shalom, guys. Well, Sister June basically said, I think, everything that I wanted to point out. But um, one thing that I have to say, what I've realized is that despite the fact that uh, Moses actually uh, 
<clears throat> let his mind lose focus due to anger throughout that time. He never turned his back on y'all. It's like when when it happened and y'all said, okay, because you did this, this is your reward for the wickedness, right? For committing sin. He was angry, but he didn't say, you know what? Oh, I'm just going to give up because at this point, it doesn't make any sense, right? He still continues your work. He still continued it. And that is something that I looked at at saying, wow, even at times when we are disobedient, because you know the goodness of your father, you just ha you have to repent and acknowledge that you're wrong and take your punishment smiling. You just have to take your punishment and keep doing his work and keep going back to him, looking to him for salvation. Because um, I haven't finished going through the story of David, but I have started it. And based on what I've seen so far, each time that he sinned, he still went back to Yah for forgiveness. And Yah did forgive him regardless of the reward that he got for it. Because we know that the wages of sin is death. So when I saw it, it says to me, listen, you are never too perfect to slip up. That's the truth of it. And you know the funny thing about it as well? Moses slipped up right at that, to me, right at that ending. Like, listen, the gate is there towards the promised land. You have done all of your work. It's just right there. And then his mind just, and it was like that promised land was taken away from him. How many of us, looking at it realistically, how many of us could be following someone, following our Elohim? We can't see him, but we know that he's there we feel him we, we we know that he's listening we have been doing his work and we're saying yes we we are he's showing us favors so he loves us you know that your father is showing you favor right and at that one point that you're supposed to get your reward and you're saying yes your mind slips you stumble you hit your foot against that stone and you're like oh no 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 Probably at that time when Moses realizes, like, oh my goodness, yeah, please let me enter. And Yah said, listen, sin is sin. I love you. I really do love you. But sin is sin. And this is, this is the reward for your sin. Because regardless if we do something good or bad, it's, it's going to be a reward. <laughs> so we're going to have to live with it. But you know, Moses took that reward regardless. He still continued to do the work of Yah, even up until his death. And that is something that I just want to put out there that these are his saints. And if they could stumble and they could find back their self with Yah, and they, even after they stumble, they still kept on doing his work. That says a lot about Yah and a lot about their characteristics as well. So for me, I am definitely learning from this. And trust me, no matter what I go through in life today, tomorrow, going forward, I will always go back to Yah because he is salvation. So I just wanted to say that out here. No, uh, Chantel, that's a, a very good uh, picture you drew as far as, you know, Moses, you know, almost there. And then, you know, it's almost like he quit in, in a sense, um, quit obeying God at that moment. And it reminds me of that photo of <clears throat> these two men, you know, chopping through uh, these this, this wall. And you see a guy that has all of this space that he has to get through to get to the end of the wall and he's chopping away. But then you see the picture of, of the guy who quit and he's like inches. Oh, if he hit the spike one more time, he would have broke through the wall, but he quit, you know, and it reminded me of a, of something that happened to me when I was running track years ago, we, we used to practice inside the, the school. So we would run around, you know the, the the floor but you couldn't see around the, the corners so we were running relay races and i couldn't see the guy that i was chasing but i know i was giving it everything yeah that's the picture he's turning around and walking away and then he's you know the one that has a lot he's fighting through right so thank you whoever shared that um so and then the track story you know, I'm I'm running this guy down, you know, he's ahead of me, but he turns the corner and I can't see it. And I'm giving it everything I got. And I'm a, my heart feels like it's about to bust out of my chest. And I I'm just I'm just just about to slow down. But at every corner, 
there, our teammates are there, you know, to encourage us to, to keep going. And just as I'm about to just slow down and give up because I don't think I'm going to catch him, one of my teammates says, don't stop. He's right there. Go get him. You know, and then I came around the corner. I gave it another push, and I passed him, you know, and, and ended up winning. Uh, and it was just for practice. But <clears throat> the point was it was to train you not to quit when you get tired, to push past that point. You know, your muscles now have that memory that when you've given it your all, there's only a little bit more to go. You can finish, you know, so. Um, but those are great pictures to show us what happened with Moshe, you know, at that moment. He got weak, you know, the effects of the people that were around him, you know, was a pause from him obeying Yah and acting on his own. And that prevented him from, and like June said earlier, there's consequences, no matter what life he lived, there's consequences to pay for our sin, you know, and we need to be mindful of that too, you know. You know, we go through the week, you know, battle after battle, we're defeating it. And then that last one, we fail, there's consequences, there's setbacks. You go right back to the beginning, because guess what? That same test is coming next week, All right? You're going to get, because you can't go to the next test until you pass that first one. Right, you can't go to the next level. Yah is taking you somewhere. Praise Yah, um, brother Mecca, and then Sister Amy. Okay, can can you hear me clear? Yes, sir. Okay, um, yeah. So one of the things for me about just about, about Moshe and his anger is that he didn't fully understand what Yahuwah was doing, because Yahu, you know, Yahuwah already told him look, I'm going to harden his heart. So Moshe should have been expecting this to happen. And when it, and when it did happen, he shouldn't have been like, oh, man, he's not listening. He should have been like, oh, well, you know, Yahuwah said he's going to harden his heart, you know. And so this must be another time Yahuwah was hardening his heart so that he can show his wonders. And it seemed like Moshe lost track of that, of what Yahuwah said and keeping that in his mind. And so you have to wonder what, you know, what was Yahuwah trying to do? What was his whole purpose behind this? It wasn't just to show that, you know, he could be this, you know, um, Elohim of a mighty hand that could destroy a nation, but it was also to show the nations that when I speak to my people and when they speak to you, you need to listen. You need to listen to their words because what they're saying will come to pass. And so he was trying to show the nations that once the power of the words um, that his people had, especially speaking on his behalf. And when you look at the, uh, when you look at the kingdom, or let's look at the word heaven, right? Let's, let's look at Shemayim, right? When you look at the word Shemayim, when you look at the paleo picto, you see the uh, Shayim, which represents the teeth or consuming. And then Mayim, which represents water, right? And so in the, in the scriptures, what does the, the scriptures say about our words? It says that um, our words, it says that the words of a man's mouth are as deep waters and the, and the wellspring of wisdom as a flowing brook. So our words to the, are like water. So pretty much when you look at Shemayim, what is Shemayim? There's, there's those who speak good. There's those who speak of Yahuwah. There's those who speak of the light, speak good things. And then there's those who speak of darkness. So what, it, what does the actual Shemayim do? It separates the waters from above from the waters below. So the father uh, looks at us and says, okay, <laughs> what you, you know, and it also says that we shall bear the fruit. We shall, uh, be filled off from the fruits of our lips. So the father looks at the words that we're saying, he, and he's marking our words down. He's listening to our words very carefully because there's power behind our words. And that's what separates the kingdom of light from the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of heaven from Sheol. And so when we're speaking Yahuwah's will, people need to understand these words. These are the words from above. These words have power. These words come to life. These are the living words that are being spoken here. 
And so when you look at now going to numbers, what happened in numbers? When Yahuwah told Moshe to speak to the rock, he was trying to tell Moshe, look, I want you to speak that water out of the rock. I want you to use your voice because why? We were made in the image of Elohim, right? Yahuwah spoke everything into existence everything into existence he spoke it into existence so he wants us to learn how our words have power behind them and our voice has power in it and he doesn't want us to be shy with that he wants us to okay you speak that into existence and he wanted to be he wanted Moshe to see that example only Moshe didn't comprehend like you who is training me you who is training me to really be in his image to speak things into existence and so because of Moshe's lack of understanding, you know, we've seen it there here in Exodus, he didn't understand Yahuwah, this is Yahuwah's hand on this, you know, just like he didn't see it later, like, okay, Yahuwah's hand's going to be on this, I just need to follow his instructions. And so because of Moshe's lack of understanding, that's why he w wasn't able to, uh, you know, get into the promised land, because he didn't understand the purpose behind what Yahuwah was you know, telling him, you know, and so it's very important that we understand Yahuwah's purpose, and that's to conform us into his image to where we trust that he's with us, and when we speak certain things, you know, in his name, according to his will, Yahuwah will make those things happen. Yeah, when it comes to the numbers passage, there, there's, you know, that that particular passage where he hits the rock, it's so much more um it's 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 ultimately about obedience but just look at the imagery who is the rock yahusha who is the water yahusha and he hits it he strikes it when he tells him to speak to it so the obedience he's even striking his son at that moment so we got to look at that whole picture when we talk about the numbers passage um here in exodus the anger I would say definitely relates to him not fully understanding what Yahuwah not only promised him, but what he was about to do. So he just needed to be obedient. And, you know, <laughs> far be it from us to say what he should have done, because we got the we got the full story already. What we're supposed to do is when we get in that same spot to do the right thing versus do the wrong thing. So um, let's let's be mindful of that um, as we read through. We have the benefit of having the full picture. We're often given these same circumstances, and we do the same thing Moshe did. <laughs> Not get to see the promised land because of our attitude, because of our anger, because of our disobedience, whatever it is that prevents us from fully seeing the full picture. Praise God. Good stuff, Omeka. Um, Sister Amy and then uh, Brother Brian. I just want to say I feel a little bit sorry for Moses when I read the story because you've got these people every second whining and whining and whining down his ear. Please who can do that. Whining down his ear and he's he's like provoked to anger as well, which is I I you can see like that he's not just getting angry like willy nilly, he's provoked to it and then obviously at the end loses his mind and strikes the rock because the people are driving him insane <laughs> and instead of hitting them maybe he's hit the rock you know because he's if we look at his, his story like how much they moan to him is crazy like persistently daily day in day out the poor man's going up the mountain he's tired he's doing all the prayers all the work and then he doesn't go in. It shows us how, um, with great responsibility, was it? With great responsibility comes, what's the word? Maybe, uh, what is it? With great responsibility, what is the word? With, the power, with great power comes great responsibility. That's what I mean, yeah. So we know that Masha was the authority of, of, of Abba. He was represented as the Aleph of the father like when he come down with the shining face and he had the horns and is the, the the word that's used which means shining so he was 
So to be in a like a position, I feel sorry for him. I because I would be probably worse than angry. I mean, like <laughs> I struggle with anger. I've shared with people before, and I always fail in it. And I just like, oh my gosh, I could never do what Moses did. I'm just like I would be. I don't even know what I'd do. So I just wanted to add it a bit. It's like I'll go in like. Yeah, no, nah, I mean, <clears throat> um, you know, when we look at <clears throat> the situation and we put ourselves in Moshe's shoes, you know, the picture you just painted was was a was an accurate one. You know, all of the voice, all of the voices of the people. You know, when we look at that numbers passage, all of the the pains. You know, the the building of the golden calf, the whining. You know. All of that goes into what we see happen. But, you know, what we have to remember is that Yahuwah was his example. He was speaking to him. He was showing him. He wanted him to exhibit his characteristics. He was giving him play by play exactly what to do. And he did not do it at that moment. And it does seem, you know, you know, interesting how Yahuwah looks at things, but as we look through scripture, we see that he's detailed to the letter, to the number, on everything. You know, we're going to go into the book of Numbers. It starts out with numbers and the accurate counts and the measurements. You know, all of these things mean something and they are to be followed to the T. You know, if I, you know, June uh, just bought a new bookshelf that, I, that I'm supposed to put together. Um, <laughs> She's smiling. Uh, but if I if I if I skip, you know, uh, instructions three through five, when I get to ten, it's going to be something wrong with that. You know what I mean? It's going to be lopsided. It's going to be missing a shelf. You know? No, we are to do things exactly the way he tells us to do them, and there is no other way around it. His law is perfect. His law is truth. His law is life. And we are to follow it to the T. So praise Yah for that. Brother Brian. Oh, oh, I just wanted to add as well, it's interesting that Moses never moans. I see when we see Moses, he's not moaning about himself. Oh, poor, he doesn't really say poor me much when I look through Moses' stuff. He's always saying, look at this people. <laughs> it's like these people you've given me. I find that interesting as well. He never actually cries about his own personal, you know, you know, we've all got personal defects. Do you never hear him saying, oh, I've got a headache or, oh, you know, I don't feel good today. Like, you know, well, we don't I'm see feeling... It. We don't see it recorded. Yeah, well, okay, I mean, well, we didn't. don't see it recorded. I mean, his actions, his actions in numbers kind of show those things that you're saying that he didn't say or didn't do, he felt them, he, he, he heard them, he, he exhibited them in his anger, and that's the point. You know, you even, if we, even if we even if we feel it, even if we see it, we don't allow it to cause us to fall into a place of sin. So um, I'm going to let Brother Brian go. Go ahead, brother. Yeah, I was just uh, I was thinking about you. Yeah. Like like Sister Amy said, Moses had a lot of like uh, pressure and responsibility on his his shoulder, that mantle he had was like, I don't know if any, it's like you, you had to be, you know, it's like you really had to be filled with the Ruach to be able to bear that that mantle that was placed on his shoulders to lead Israel out and to deal with all of the, uh, the unbelief and, and everything else. Um, but I was thinking about too, like with his um, father-in-law Jethro, he told him, he uh, gave him advice in Exodus, I think it's Exodus 18. It's like, you tell him like, you, you, you carrying too much of the, of the burden. You gotta, you gotta delegate leadership, delegate captains over, over the people, judges over the people. And, and it was good advice they gave him because Moses was taking all, everything on his shoulders. And, uh, and then later on in Numbers, um, in Numbers, uh, was it chapter, Numbers chapter 11, verse 29, when Yahuwah commands Noah to get the 70 elders, it says, um, 
in verse 23, and, and Yahuwah said unto Moshe, is Yahuwah's hand waxed short, thou shalt see. Uh, thou shalt see my word shall come to pass unto thee or not. And Moshe went out and told the people the words of Yahuwah and gathered the 70 men of the elders of the people and set them round about in the tabernacle. And Yahuwah came down in a cloud and spake unto him and took of, his, of the Ruach that was upon him and gave it unto the 70 elders. And it came to pass that when the Ruach rested upon them, they prophesied and did not cease. But there remained two of the men in the camp. The name of one was Eldad and the name of the other Madod. And the Ruach rested upon them and they were of them that were written but went not out into the tabernacle and they prophesied in the camp. And there ran a young man and told Moshe and said, Eldad and Nadad do prophesy in the camp. And Yahshua, the son of Nun, the servant of Moshe, one of the young men answered and said, my master Moshe forbid them. And, this, uh, and Moshe said unto him, envious thou for my sake, would Yahuwah that all uh, uh, Yahuwah's people were prophets and that Yahuwah would put his Ruach upon them. And so this is interesting, interesting here, like Moshe is like, he's like, man, I wish everybody was prophesying. It was like, I was just to say like, that was like less strain on me if they could all prophesy and they wouldn't all be looking at me for, uh, for everything. Cause it's like, when you look at the uh, Mount Sinai, the people were, uh, were scared of, they, they t told the, uh, they told Moshe, you speak to Yahuwah and then you, you come and tell us what he says. And so you have this like, Yahuwah is wanting to dwell amongst the people, but the people are scared because of, because I believe because of, uh, of sin in their, in, because of the hardness of their heart, their sin is separating them from the most high and they're scared. And, um, and, and Yahuwah has to, uh, is limited. He wants to flow amongst the people, but the people are not ready. Their hearts are hardened still. They still have Misraim in their heart that has to be cleansed. And, uh, and so, yeah, it's like, you see this dynamic of like this, like I could see this, like he's in Moses' heart. He's like, he wishes everybody could do what he's doing. And, but the people are just like, just wanted him to interface with Yahuwah. And it's like, and you see that how Yahuwah always wanted his spirit to flow amongst his people, but the people didn't want that. And it's like, even today, like I see like, it's almost that Moses, that Moses paradigm and, and a lot of like our, 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 our ministries where people look to the quote unquote man of, of God and, and it's like, oh, whatever. It, no one's like, it, people become stagnated and they're not, they become stagnated and they don't really fulfill their true destiny because they have that Moses type of mentality where it's like, oh, only God only use a particular person, but the word says he's no respecter of persons. And people, he wants to, people to flow in their gifts and everything like that. And, and most shades and that frustration, uh, I see that he wants, he wants, he wants, he wanted that for the people, but the people didn't, didn't want it for themselves. And, and Yahoo is not, is a perfect gentleman. He's not going to violate your will and things. So, um, so yeah, I'll just, uh, and then too, I, I didn't too, with the uh, last point I wanted to make about Moshe is, um, uh, one of the things that I, that I think is important when I look at Yahusha's ministry, there was times where Yahusha, he went off by himself and, and prayed and meditated and, and, uh, and on several occasions that I, I see in the gospels when, you know, he, he told his disciples to go ahead of him and, and uh, cross the Sea of Galilee. And he, he went off to meditate and get, get by himself. And, and it's, it's those times as a, as a, as a leader, you can get so busy about the ministry and things that you need that balance, that time to recharge your spiritual battery so that when those times come, when, like if you get angry or something like that, that you don't sin, that you'll be full, full of recharged with the Ruach. If you full of his Ruach and you'll be sober and keep your wits about you, that, that you spit that time in the most high and you, you got like a spiritual recharge, so to speak. And, and, and so you can avoid, I think that helps to avoid those times of 
falling or stumbling when you can have that balance. And that's what I saw in Yahusha's ministry. He had that balance where he had that time where he just got off by himself. And it was just him and the most high. And, um, and, and uh, so, yeah, I just, I just thought, yeah, I thought that was interesting. But that, that's it, Sean. Yeah, brother, you said a lot there. Um, uh, you know, I'm not going to try to answer or respond to everything you said, but I think, you know, <clears throat> when you look at, you know, the people, the Israelites, um, they very often didn't understand the relationship that Yahuwah was desiring with them. You know, because we see later, not, not you know, a couple books later, they wanted kings like the other nations had kings instead of just listening to Yah. So he gave them kings, you know? He gave them what they desired, even though that's not what he desired for them. Um, and I think sometimes that happens in our lives. We're not paying attention to the will he has for our lives and we want those other things. And he says, hey, you can have it. And then we end up coming back to him. So he wants us to avoid those pitfalls. Very good point you brought up about Jethro and how Moshe went to him and Jethro said, nah, you got to delegate. You can't, you can't do this all by yourself, Rick. You need, you know, Jadiel, you need Rod, you need JP, you need some women leaders, you need, you know, some strong brothers like Brian and Omeka, you know, to start stepping up. So all of these things are happening because the people were being obedient or, like we always said, disobedient to Yah. And I think he pulls all of these things out of them to show them who he is and to show them how they are to serve him. So oh, good points, brother um, Jim. Yeah, those are good, definitely good points about Yah showing Moshe through the father-in-law how to delegate. I agree, you know, we got to take those breaks and it does help us, you know, to keep our, because we tend to be more angry, you know, when we're exhausted and, you know, running on fumes, you know, so I think it is wisdom to you know, delegate and break it up and stuff. Um, but I really loved uh, Sister Amy's comment too about the people moaning <laughs> and groaning and stuff like that. Um, and, uh, but at the end of the day, he, he, you know, Moshe was still obedient. I mean, disobedient. Um, and I was reminded of in, in Exodus 4, where one of his sons wasn't circumcised and Yah was about to kill him <laughs> before he even got to Egypt. <laughs> even though he was the chosen one called to deliver the children, Yah was about to smite him because, you know, I guess it was his wife's son who had a different culture or whatnot. Um, so, so Yah is consistent. Um, but even though he, disobeyed and didn't see the promised land we do see Moshe showing up in the transfiguration you know so we know that you know he still has um like a I guess he's still like a, a um like a a, a a position of honor you know for for him to show up with I think it was Abraham and I'm, I'm not sure the third individual while yes yahushua was praying in the in the brit um that was that was interesting um but i think at the end of the day yah has to be true to his word and show make people an example you know and that's why it's so good we have to run that race to the very end like we have to finish well as well as run the race well because because yeah you know it's scary when you read absolutely when the woman studied what Yah did to Moses' sister, you know, they gave her leprosy and whatnot and booted her out the camp because he overheard her talking smack about Moshe, you know, and that's scary. You know, Yah will make an example out of you as we see with Mo Moses when he hit that rock. So I think we're um, out of Exodus 11 here, but... <laughs> I just wanted to share. Praise Yah. <laughs> Praise Yah. Always, always good to hear, you know, 
what y'all are showing us, you know, even if it goes elsewhere, it's it's part of what we're looking at because we're looking at Moshe and you know, you know, we look we look in Hebrews, you know, every one that's mentioned in the Hall of Faith had jacked up, <laughs> you know, they had they did jacked up things, you know, and it's important that we see, you know, that, that, that Yah shows us the imperfections in the people that we are called to be like, because ultimately when he looks at us, he sees his son. He says in the next chapter, chapter 12, I'm looking for the blood. Is the blood of Yahusha on you? So that covers everything that you were and did before you turned to him. And that's why we still see him, like you said, in a position of honor and spoke of and on the mount, you know, when Yahusha prayed in the transfiguration. So it's important that we can continue and finish this race that we're in so that Yah so that Yahuwah can see his son in us because we exhibited we exhibited those characteristics. We trusted him, we believed in him, and we acted the way he wanted us to. So praise Yah. Um JP and then Brian again. Just wanted uh, to add, you know, there was a, 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 a deity, uh, false deity, of course, out there in, in Egypt at the time, uh, Meshkinet. And uh, just looking at, like, what, seeing all the, of course, as we've been seeing through the plagues, there were, pers I mean, specific deities that they believed in that didn't come to their rescue. Mm -hmm. And so, again, you know, we see it again over, over, and over. This time... It's almost like at its ele like elevated peak because everything else was like, okay, the animals, all right. There was some, you know, some bugs, some frogs, and, I, and they were still getting affected, but now it's life. They're getting affected with life, you know, this taking of life from them. And now, you know, I can only imagine, you know, the way the Egyptians, these people were probably really like just, they're, their faith quote unquote in what they believed in has been just trampled down and so i always wonder like you know maybe some of them even like turned and said wow like this is the truth over here you know i don't know you know i'm just i'm just speculating of course and assuming but but, but that's what i can see you know just like you know you you see today people coming from different uh religions mm. um different backgrounds and culturals cultures they come and they see yahoo and then they see what the people the set apart ones are living in and then they start to just like we talk about recognize and say whoa that that's truth right there that that man or that woman they're glowing they're not just they're glowing with something and i need to know what that is and so so i just i just want to bring that up how he yahoo was just continually and this one was like an elevated type of a, of a situation you know, you said a couple things that are very important there. Um, and, you know, when we look at, you know, what we are to be, when we, we look at Romans 12 and it says, present your bodies as a, as a living sacrifice. And one of the things I was hinting to, you know, out of Rick's message this morning when it comes to the Great Commission, you know, you know, we, we are not to discount the fact that we are to, to preach his word. Take to take his word out, but one of the things that we seem to misunderstand is allowing our lives to be an example. And you said it clearly: when calamity hits, when people are in disarray, when their minds are blown by the things of this world, who do they come to? You know, do they? Do, do, who do they come? Do they come to you? Do they say, "Yo, man, I just wanted to run something by you, man. I know you. You know you, man. You, you look. You read the word. You know." Um, um, what do you think? You know what I mean? Do they come to you, or do they say, "Ah, oh, that crazy dude"? He, you know, he don't. He don't really live like that. He talks a good word, but he don't. He was. He was down there hanging with us at the club. You know, there's a difference. There's a separation. Our lifestyles become an example. Our lifestyles become a conversation piece. Our lifestyles become the draw that brings out those who would want to turn to Torah. You know, when he tells us to go out and make go out and make taught ones, go out and and seek, he's looking for those that turn and understand there's a difference between the way they're living 
in what you say you believe in because they see your life. And that draws the true turn. It's not, you know, we go out on the corner and just start preaching the word to a bunch of people, you know, and they turn around and call you crazy. It's to draw people that have an interest in what you're saying. You know, and I think we really got to look at that and dig deeper on what the Great Commission is telling us to do. I had started to look at it a little bit, but it's a little bit more than us just, you know, dropping off in the country and start preaching the word. It's He's saying something different there. He's saying something different there. And I think we got to, if we're going to pay attention to his word, we got to pay attention to his word. That means flip the English upside down and go into what it's saying. So, um, but yeah, <laughs> we are to be living, living epistles. We're, we are to be read. They ought to look at us and be able to read some scripture, literally, you know? Go ahead, um, uh, Rick, and then Brian. No, I was just saying that sounds like a good good study for maybe next next Shabbat. Uh, I don't know about next Shabbat, but you know, I'm, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'm looking at some things. Um, Brian. Yeah, I was just uh, I was just wondering. That, yeah, it's interesting um, that uh, I think Sister Drew brought it up the the Mount Transfiguration. Uh, when Moshe was there, because we had a, uh, I think, and forgive me if I say your name wrong, sister, I think it's Sister Tasha brought up, she had a question about what happens after, like, life after death and things, and I thought, yeah, it's like, I was thinking about that myself last night, I was thinking about the Mount Transfiguration, where Moshe is there talking to, to Yahusha, and it kind of like, it's like, it makes, one of those things that you go, hmm, when it, when it comes to what, what this really means to sleep when you die, and things like that, and like what happens to your your spirit versus your your body, and things like that. So just yeah, just I don't know it's it's all they'll be all talking, but it just made me one of those things. Maybe uh, think about what we had we discussed last night. So no, nah, um, nah. I mean that's that's real, man. That's um that that's that's definitely a question that I have when I look at that passage, and then I read what it tells us in Thessalonians. You know, when I read when it tells you we're asleep. You know. Um, but yeah, definitely something to to be mindful of, and and we're gonna dig it up. You know us. We're gonna we're gonna dig all that stuff up. Praise God. Um, anything more on chapter eleven? All right. Well, this concludes our Exodus chapter eleven study. Uh, praise God. Uh, Shabbat Shalom. Shalom, Akuti, and Rohim. Thank you so much for viewing this video. We hope it was helpful to your walk in the truth. Remember to always search the scriptures on your own, to study Abba's word, and show yourself approved according to 2 Timothy 2.15. We invite you to study with us. To join us in a live study, just go to our website, at assemblyofyahuwah.com and click the Join Us tab. We have something available Wednesday through Saturday of every week. If you've been Baruch or blessed by this video today or any other study, we encourage you to go to the Giving tab on our website. Our elders all have their own ways of income, so none of the giving or proceeds go to them. Instead, it goes to biblical assembly needs. We also encourage you to subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you don't miss any new videos. We sincerely pray that Abba continues to direct your path as you acknowledge Him in all your ways. Much avaha and again shalom.